one that's actually embracing the fact that we all have biases and that we all see reality differently. That's why we take multiple measurements from different perspectives with different instruments by different people. And it's an international collaboration and, you know, why you repeat experiments and, you know, change variables and try different things. It's because we know that we have biases and filters and we accept that we can still work towards the goal of understanding reality. Welcome to the Rogue Journal Club, where we tear studies apart so you don't have to. The Rogue Journal Club is a Shio Sophia production, featuring long-form discussions of peer-reviewed studies, published in academic journals, and their connections to society. I'm Adrian, And I'm Gina. We'll be your hosts. A journal club is when academics at universities get together to talk about papers. But we've gone rogue. We're going to do Journal Club our way. Join us. On this episode of the Rogue Journal Club, we engage in a discussion based on the article, Constructing International Politics. The article is written by Alexander Wendt, and it appeared in a 1995 issue of International Security, published by MIT Press. different for us this time around as we don't have a research article per se to yeah discussion but i would still say it's a science forward article though which is nice when you know you dig into what i guess is the humanities kind of uh it's a political science paper it's from an international politics journal um trying to figure out oh it's in international security and it was actually published in 1995 so the, uh, the reason we are talking about this is because we were engaging with someone in our comment section uh, who had what appeared to be a misunderstanding of postmodernism uh, and what it actually is. Uh, and I, I had heard about this person, Alexander Wendt, who writes about this through my husband. And... Um, recognized that the commenter was possibly uh, thinking that postmodernism is actually constructivism. And those are two different things. And then Adrian was like, we should talk about that sometime. And I was like, I'm going to find a paper by that guy because I know he exists and I bet he's written about it. And lo and behold, he had. Um, so I'll say first off that neither of us are in international politics. I don't know one iota about the field. Um, but what I thought was valuable about this paper was how he differentiates between constructivism and postmodernism and sort of where the different schools of thought go wrong. And I think it shows really clearly how we have activists and what possibly might be behind why so many of our academic friends have like swallowed the DEI narrative mm -hmm. without realizing that it is anti-science. And then when you try to tell them that it's anti-science, they think you're being um, like hyperbolic or something when in fact they may actually be reading it as constructivism, which isn't actually necessarily anti-science, but postmodernism definitely is. So we mm -hmm. will um, kind of dive into that. But basically it's this paper that was written by Alex Went in response to another scholar named John Mearsheimer, who I like a lot and you should check out his lectures on YouTube, uh, especially if you have maybe a more conservative view of international politics. He, he represents that side really well, I think. Um, and I believe that Mearsheimer and Went actually um, are friendly to each other. So this is one of those Ad, fr friendly adversarial journal sparring kind of things. And it happened like uh, 25 years ago. So this isn't a current event, um, but it is a really good paper that kind of laid the foundation, what I think anyway, for using constructivism in political science. So um, so that's the, the outline of that. It's called Constructing International Politics. Um, and it's in International Security, Volume 20, Number 1, Summer 1995, page 71. So if you want to go find it on Google Scholar, it's there. So It will also be linked in the description for anybody who wants to go find it. I will go dig up a link for it. But, yep. um, of course, obviously, some of this may be 
because I this was probably published. Yeah, this was published pre open access related things. So it may be a little mm -hmm. difficult to get a hold of it because it is quite possibly behind a paywall unless you're on a university campus. So <laughs> that yeah. could be the problem with that. But um, do our best to make things available. Um, yeah, and so, yeah, you have it right. That's that's where a lot of this uh, got started when we were thinking about it. And, and you also just like to, to reemphasize, neither of us are experts on international policy or international politics. Um, so that's not yeah. going to be the focus of this discussion as much as the epistemological, I think that's the word, differences yeah. between <laughs> constructivism yeah. and postmodernism, um, yeah. along with some critiques of both that I have from um, from the great Thomas Sowell, which if you're not reading this book, I suggest you read it because it is a fabulous book. Yeah, man. So, yeah. And also, uh, it's worth noting that the author of this paper and the author he's critiquing are like BFDs in the international politics area. So they're not, these are like very senior people that know their stuff. So I want to over and over emphasize that I'm in no way critiquing their work in their respective disciplines. I am highly unqualified for that. I am, as far as <laughs> their field is concerned, not even an undergraduate level of understanding of this field. I just really liked their take on epistemology, which is something I read a lot about, Adrian reads a lot about. So, um, so I'm going to get, I'm going to try to figure out how to dive into this, give an overview, because there's no abstract. It's, it's actually not a research article. It's um, a philosophical <laughs> article um, where it sort of outlines a position on, on using constructivism in international relations. So these are people who study how states uh, communicate with each other and, you know, security, war, peace, the big, sort of the big things that happen in the, on the planet. And it's, it's interesting. Uh, the, the last half of this paper is really all about like how states deal with diplomacy and war and solve kind of all those problems. And given the Israel Palestine thing going on right now, it is actually kind of an interesting thing to read as a lay person, given that that has happened. Uh, and it happened since I downloaded the paper and read it the first time. So then reading it the second time, I was like, yeah, yeah, this is definitely more appropriate than we all thought it would be, uh, even though it was written in the 90s. So the reason for for this choice is that uh, the person he's critiquing, so he's responding to um, this guy, John Mearsheimer's paper, The False Promise of International Institutions, um, which is also online, but you got to dig it out of a, a book. It's, so the PDF of the book is online, but you have to find it in there. Um, and I haven't read that paper, so I, I'm kind of going off of what uh, Went says, Mearsheimer says here. So he's responding to what is called um, realism, I think. So there are people in international politics that maybe think that states, um, the, the power imbalances between different states have to do with their material um resources so like weapons and natural resources and things like that and that uh he claims that the realists don't take social relationships between countries and cultural relationships and historical relationships between states as being relevant and that what underlies it is is usually material um and then the other side which is represented by this paper is that you have to look at the structures um, which are the social relationships between the countries um, that are interacting in addition to the material resources and that you can't have a meaningful discussion about international politics without including the structures and the relationships, which is what he calls constructivism. So this is something where when you hear DEI activists say um, knowledge uh, is based on uh, time and place or culture or something like that, they're saying that um, what kinds of questions we ask and what kinds of things we study and what our focus is on is always going to be biased by the time and place and the culture that it, that the questions are being asked in. So that's actually constructivism. And that is, I think, what a lot of people think is postmodernism. But postmodernism is something completely different. And that is that there is no objective reality to know, that there is no 
the, there is basically uh, no point in claiming that anything is true and that there's no knowledge to gain because it's all just a product of our perceptions and the theories we develop and it's imposed rather than like understood um, and that there isn't any truth really. And so the commenter and I were talking back and forth and it sounded like they were telling me that they were actually fine with the existence of objective truth. Um, but just to keep in mind that knowledge is um, shaped by culture, time and place. So, um, but he was saying that in, or I don't know if it was a he, it might've been a she, I have no idea. Um, but um, they were saying this in defense of postmodernism, but it's actually a defense of constructivism. So this paper talks about how you can do constructivism without postmodernism and that it can still be a rational scientific enterprise. And that um, was really important to me to see because I thought, okay, so if there's all these DEI workshops that are being held at universities, which Adrian's more familiar with, I've never attended one, except I guess I sort of attended one virtually to see what it was all about. And wow, that was an insane <laughs> experience. Maybe, I don't know if this one's representative of, but. I saw one. So, so you go into these workshops and you've got these trainings that professors are going to, and they kind of come out, some of them come out like wanting to be activists or they come out wanting to like do DEI in their labs or their institutions. And they feel really like inspired by it. And I'm like, why, how are they being inspired by this? It seems crazy, but I think they're being sold the idea that um, because knowledge is uh, biased by time, place, and culture, that means we have to throw all the knowledge out rather right. than just seeing that as maybe one face of reality that is incomplete and we need to include more, but it doesn't mean right. the stuff that we now know is wrong. So they, so I think maybe when you're not, when, um, yeah, anyway, just go ahead. Say, I, I wanted to dig it up because you're, you're talking about constructivism mm -hmm. versus postmodernism. And, and for those following along with this, I actually also encourage you to read Cynical Theories by uh, James Lindsay and Helen Pluckrose because they actually trace the things like critical theory, um, critical race theory, all the rest to their roots in postmodernist thought um, in here. And so they provide actually what I think are some pretty decent definitions of uh, what postmodernism is um, as well as it's sort of four pillars, um, if you will. Um, so yeah, I just looked it up yeah. here and you tell me if this makes sense. Um, <clears throat> let's see, do, do, where, which one is it? Oh, there we go. Um, what though is postmodernism reading from cynical theories? The online Encyclopedia Britannica defines postmodernism postmodernism as quote a late 20th century movement characterized by broad skepticism subjectivism or relativism a general suspicion of reason and an acute sensitivity to the role of ideology in asserting and maintaining political and economic power walter truett anderson writing in 1996 describes the four pillars of postmodernism the social construction of the concept of self, self identity is constructed by cultural forces and is not given to a person by tradition. Uh, relativism of moral and ethical discourse. Morality is not found, but made. That is morality is not based on cultural or religious tradition, nor is it a mandate of heaven, but is constructed by dialogue and choice. This is relativism, not in the sense of being non-judgmental, but in the sense of believing all forms of morality are socially constructed cultural worldviews. Deconstruction in art and culture. The focus is on endless playful improvisation and variation on themes and mixing of high and low culture. And globalizations. People see borders as of all kinds as social constructions that can be crossed and reconstructed and are inclined to take their tribal norms less seriously. Many agree that postmodernism is centered on a number of primary themes, no matter how much postmodernists might resist such a characterization. Uh, for Steiner Cavale, professor of psychology and director of the Center of Qualitative Research, the central themes of postmodernism include doubting that any human truth provides an objective representation of reality, focusing on language and the way societies use it to create their own realities, and denying the universal. These, he explains, resulted in an increased interest in narrative and storytelling, particularly when truths, 
in quotes, are situated within particular cultural constructs and a relativism that accepts that different descriptions of reality cannot be measured against one another in any final that is objective way. The key observation following Cavale is that the postmodern turn brought about an important shift away from the modernist dichotomy between objective universal and the subjective individual and toward local narratives and the lived experiences of their narrators. In other words, the boundary between that which is objectively true and that which is subjectively experienced ceased to be accepted. The perception of society as formed of individuals interacting with universal reality in unique ways which underlies the liberal principles of individual freedom, shared humanity, and equal opportunities, was replaced by multiple allegedly equally valid knowledges and truths constructed by groups of people with shared markers of identity related to their positions in society. Knowledge, truth, meaning, and morality are therefore, according to postmodernist thinking, culturally constructed and relative products of individual cultures, none of which possess the necessary tools or terms to evaluate the others. Does that make? Yeah, I think so. And I think what's tough about that is there was a lot of constructivism woven into it, into what you read. So I think separating those two is really important. And there is a paragraph in the paper that really hits it, I think, on the head. Oh, that's actually, this is actually what I was looking for. And this may, this may seem a little okay. more constructive. Yeah, go for it. Because they, um, in cynical theories, they had two um, two postmodern principles, two two principles of postmodernism with four themes. Um, the postmodern knowledge principle, which is radical skepticism about whether objective knowledge or truth is obtainable, and a commitment to cultural constructivism. Right. And the postmodern political principle, which is a belief that society is formed of systems of power and hierarchies which decide what can be known and how. Mm, yeah, and that's and closer I, to the postmodern rather than the constructivist. So there certainly yeah. was a constructivism woven in there um, in the earlier part that I read. Yeah, and I think so. Man, there's so many thoughts I have about that. The so, idea that that there's like the the um, that knowledge is decided by some kind of hierarchy and like what's acceptable knowledge. That's an extremely naive way of seeing knowledge, and I don't think. I don't think, and I say this, maybe I'm wrong, but it's mostly students who see it that way because they were probably very much more recently living in a sort of top-down dominance model type of life where they lived at home with their parents, where their parents decided everything for them. And, you know, then they, um, they grew up and they moved out and they, for some reason, didn't make the transition into adulthood fully. And I have some thoughts about why that doesn't happen as much in, anymore, but that's a totally different topic. But they Another come day. in, yeah, they come into the world uh, as like physical adults, but with still that sort of child mindset. And maybe some that personality type is more common in the university environment because there can be a lot of things about being in the university that are infantilizing, even for being like a full functioning working adult you almost have to resist some of those cultural things where you you just you feel like you're in school forever i mean i had that feeling i felt like i don't feel like i'm in my 30s <laughs> i feel like they're treating me like i'm an 18 year old who has to be like i don't know it was just a weird environment so i mean you work still in that world and it's possible that you know and you do you kind of like get what i'm talking about that culture of like infantilization in schools um there, uh, to a degree, I do because I have seen um, the students behave in ways <laughs> that suggest right. that. But it isn't yeah. true of all students. There, there are a lot of students who I have met who have, yes, they may be very left of center, but they, they have good sense to recognize that they can't control everything. And that's actually, yeah. I think, a very healthy thing to realize yeah. that you can't control and change the world. Because I think if you lose that sort of boundary and constraints to your own thinking it can leave you adrift and very anxiety driven and uh, yeah. depressed and what have you when you realize you're putting in all this effort and the world isn't changing um <laughs> yeah and it's like yeah there's the the sort of i guess mood in all of the dei activist circles is that there are these powers that be that are just like floating above us all that determine all the truth 
and determine all the knowledge and all the correct morals and all of what's appropriate. And then they impose it on the rest of us. And it's never really clear where that line is between them and us. And this is a problem in general with populism. And like, I see it on the right too. Like, who are they? You know, it's, it's definitely, a, it's definitely populist. It's, mm. it's that idea that there's an elite cloud of, you know, someone's pulling all the strings um, and that, you know, there could be conspiracies, but those are hypotheses you can test unless they happen to be formulated in a way that they are untestable. And then they sort of fall into the pseudoscience realm. I've stopped even using the word conspiracy theory because it's very, uh, loaded. And I think because there are conspiracies, you can, you can falsify like well-formulated questions about conspiracies, or you could formulate a bad question and then it's, a, it's pseudoscience. So those are, that's how I'm like d differentiating it, but I'm on a tangent now. So I think <laughs> this idea that there's like this top down model that we all live under, I think under uh, that must come from Marxism, I think, because that's how Karl Marx sort of described capitalism. Oh, and yeah. Karl Marxism has, um, he, in a number of the writings, he has what's called the dialectic. Um, but there's also the sort of dichotomy he referred to it as the bourgeoisie versus the proletariat and of course the bourgeoisie are in control of everything and exploiting everything in the proletariat and so he set up this he set up this dichotomy um with the dialectical thinking that it's either one or the other kind of kind of thing and um that kind of framing is very much the root of and again this is shown in cynical theories in a number of different places in the literature at this point that it is very much the root of the thinking in DEI related circles and any of the critical theories rooted in postmodernism that they take a very same thing and they they're not shy about it a bunch of the literature for for critical theory they basically say yeah we got our thoughts from Herbert Marcuse or we got it from uh, go back far enough to Karl Marx or Friedrich Engels um, and those kinds of thinkers in that whole train operate the same way. So oftentimes in the DEI trainings, you'll see um, a sort of dialectic of uh, oppressor versus oppressed. Um, and it's still very much drawn from, from the thinking of Marx um, in there in Herbert Marcuse and what have you also. Um, there's another, there's another Paula Freire. There was the other one. Um, <laughs> that it was thinking yeah. of. Um, but then you can also get into um, sometimes also the sort of softer version of it um, is privileged versus marginalized. Um, saying one group yeah. is privileged over another and they have all this benefit to you uh, that you don't have if you're a marginalized person. Um, yeah. I guess a lot that's of all. Different. Yeah. I guess that's all just the us and them model. Where it's, it's an us and them. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's very hard to tell when you drill down into those topics, like power in general is a really hard term to define. Um, well, because I like, don't really believe that there is an ultimate truest, truest definition for anything. It is hard to know what people mean when they're saying power. And when you try to uh, engage in a conversation about like, what, like, how do you decide, like, is it a certain amount of money that you have to have? Is it like how many layers up in the corporate hierarchy are you? Like if you're a CEO, are you them? But if you're like a manager, are you not them? Are you us then? Like, how do you know where the dividing line is between, you know, it, it's like any, any of these sort of nebulous topics, like famous and powerful and rich at like where, when you look at it in an us versus them kind of way, how do you know so I don't know how we ended up on this topic, but I think it was by way of figuring out what people's thought processes are when they go into these trainings and they're like, yeah, that makes sense to me. I don't, I, I know there was a point in my life where some of these ideas made sense to me, but it, I, I think I was a, a much less happy person at that time. And I needed something to explain why I was in pain. And yeah. th those were the ideas that found me at the time. It could have been a different set of ideas that found me, but those happened too, because I spent almost my whole life in school. So that's what was there. Um, but it was really the postmodernism that was the most harmful, I think, because once you remove, um, once you take away from someone the ability to learn 
and make decisions based on what they have learned and to explain experiences based on things that they have learned, then you basically rip the foundation out from under their well-being. And you can really go pretty crazy um, if your worldview is based on postmodernism. And that um, is not the same thing as you know, looking at, you know, how social relationships impact our choices on an international scale, or even on a domestic yeah. scale or interpersonal, or in the workplace, uh, or how different cultures interpret things differently. And how, yeah, the fact that uh, most of science started in, uh, in Britain, that it's the, the, the British culture that may have influenced a lot of the early scientific questions we asked, but it doesn't mean that like, gravity is not a thing, just because Isaac Newton thought of it and he was a white man, you know, though, and you talked about that in your side chat with Deb. So I won't, I won't hammer on that one in particular. You all did, did it for me, yeah, no, but it's... yeah, I mean, it's fine to admit that constructivism against the notion of universalism that that could have. Um, and that's one of the things that comes up in cynical theories. It comes up in a lot of the postmodernist literature that, you know, universalism is apparently that 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 discovery of gravity wouldn't have happened if it weren't for it being, well, not, not the discovery of gravity. I, that's not the right way to say it. The formulation of the concept that is gravity um, to our understanding, to wrap our mind around the fact of why do you, when you drop a ball, it falls instead of just mm -hmm. sticking right there. Right. Yeah. Um, that, that concept wouldn't have, would have been defined differently or arisen differently or been not generalizable to anywhere else in the world or something like, along that line. Yeah. If somebody else had done that, that's not, tr that doesn't fall in line with the universalism idea of science and liberal knowledge and what have you. Anybody mm -hmm. around the world could have discovered gravity. And to one of the points that, that were made, um, that has been made many times, it's quite possible somebody did. It's just a question of whether or not they wrote it down. <laughs> That's a huge thing. I, I mean, the fact that some societies didn't write and maybe if they did, the climate in their region wasn't conducive to preserving it. That mm -hmm. I mean, why was the Alexandria Library in Egypt uh, so uh, robust and well-preserved because it's dry in Egypt? And if mm -hmm. there was any other place in the world that had a library that was more humid, the paper would have molded and disintegrated. This is, I actually read this in a book called The Book, yeah. which is a really good book. It's a book about books. <laughs> so if you're like a huge nerd like me and you love books, it's uh, Keith Houston, The Book. He explains like the technology of, of, a, of a, a book, like how we got mm -hmm. that, like what the history of that whole process is. Um, and yeah, so like, things being written down, it, yes, of course, that's going to bias like certain cultures and locations on the planet to having some kind of dominant say. And I mean, I hate that word dominant, but sure, I'll use it. Some kind of dominance on the scientific stage. It's so, uh, quite often a coincidence of nature. And that's right. uh, hard for a lot of people to accept. <laughs> well, so. and, and this is, this is where I come back to this book because early on in the book, um, Sama Soul gets into what's, it's sort of an underlying assumption. Tell me if you think I'm wrong. It's sort of an underlying assumption I see, particularly in the postmodernist and extending into the DEI and the critical social justice in particular, is the notion of what's called the equal chances fallacy. Um, Jean-Jacques Rousseau talks about this in, in some, some depth where his kind of thought is, well, yeah, if all things are being exactly equal, everybody would have equal outcomes. Now, on its face, that sounds great. That sounds like that logically makes sense. The problem with that is nowhere in history has any individual or any two groups of people been exactly equal in exactly equal circumstances or anything along that yeah. line. Um, and a good example, like what you just mentioned at the Library of Alexandra, is the climate. <laughs> The climate yeah. makes it conducive to grow certain things in certain places. And so um, you end up with certain things in people's diets and what have you, and different health yeah. outcomes is part of that. And that's yeah. not necessarily a cultural thing. That's just the climate and what you can grow there. <laughs> yeah, it's just, it's where people groups happen to land over the thousands and thousands of years that we roam the earth. And yeah, I mean, there's a guy, Jared Diamond, that I'm sure progressives hate him. Um, he, he was not the person to think of all these ideas, um, but he's a geographic determinist, I guess that's his, uh, 
at least that's what the progressives call him. Um, and he was mainly a, a popularizer of these ideas, but was also a researcher. And his books are are uh, good. J Guns, Germs, and Steel is the famous one that um, explains actually what we're talking about related to climate and farming and diet specifically, and how and how like Northern Europe and the Americas and basically all a lot of the mid latitude countries how they ended up with rationality and science and technology and democracy and all those things, how they may have possibly ended up with those things first. And it had a lot to do with an accident of, of geographic location and resources, which is super uncomfortable if you're somebody that cares about human rights and wanting people to live a good life, like a high quality of life and you know, those kinds of things. So it's a, it's kind of an icky thing to think about, but we shouldn't shy away from it just because it's uncomfortable. So, um, but those are, I think those are examples, honestly, of how uh, we can, we can't ever be all the same. And, you know, let's not even getting into evolution. Evolution wouldn't work if we were all exactly the same. The, mm -hmm. the individual variation is the, like one of the, the ingredients that drives evolution. So it, it wouldn't work if we were all the same, we would not have. So, you know, in a way at the root of it all, a lot of these ideas are evolution denial at their roots because we don't want to accept that individual variation exists. It doesn't mean that the way things worked out is like the ideal way or the optimal way or the morally correct way. It's just how things landed. You know, you throw a rock in the air and where it lands is where it lands. It, it, does that mean that, that was the morally correct place for that rock to land? <laughs> no, it just means that's where it landed. So Foucault, yeah. that was the other one I was trying to think of. Michel Foucault as uh, another one of the most modernist thinkers. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So yeah, I, here's, here's, just to hammer it again about the objective yeah. reality, there's a couple of things because a lot of a lot of what like the empiricism of science relies on is the correspondence theory of truth in that objective truths can be established as being true by their correspondence to how things actually are. So like <laughs> you can figure out physics related concept, you can put it somewhere else. And if you're able to predict what happens based from your physics related concepts somewhere else in the world, you've yeah. hit something that is real, um, <clears throat> is real and true. But um Postmodernism just generally rejects that line of notion of the correspondence yeah. theory of truth, um, which again, of course, core of objectivity when you're talking about science, actually. So yeah. French philosopher Michel Foucault, a central figure of postmodernism, expresses the same doubt when he argues that, quote, in any given culture at any given moment, there is always only one episteme that defines the conditions of possibility of all knowledge, whether expressed in a theory or silently invested in a practice. Foucault was especially interested in the relationship between language, or more specifically discourse, ways of talking about things, the production of knowledge and power. He explored these ideas at length throughout the 1960s in such works as the madness, as madness and civilization, the birth of the clinic, the order of things, and the archaeology of knowledge. For Foucault, a statement reveals not just information, but also the rules and conditions of a discourse. These then determine the construction of truth claims and knowledge. Dominant discourses are extremely powerful because they give because they determine what can be considered true, thus applicable in a given time and place. Thus, sociopolitical power is the ultimate determiner of what is true in Foucault's analysis, not correspondence with reality. Foucault was so interested in the concept of how power influences what is considered knowledge that in 1981, he coined the term power knowledge to convey the inextricable link between powerful discourse, discourses and what is known. Foucault called a dominant set of ideas and values an episteme because it shapes how we identify and interact with knowledge. <clears throat> yeah. So, so that goes to the idea that apparently all knowledge um, all of what is considered tr true is constructed by the powerful, the right. postmodernist thought there. Not that it's actually corresponding with reality. Um, yeah, and it's it's very much still like a blending of constructivism and postmodernism again. That's I keep hearing that because it's like the postmodernism part. Well, all right, I'm going to flip to this because I want to get back I to when here. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. I, I, I think it, no, it's okay. Well, it's um, interesting interactions with all of these different papers and things. So this is going to be Yeah. Fun. 
I know this is a, it's a complicated episode. So, so far, everything we've been reading has been not necessarily from the, the paper at hand, but it's right. good because this paper doesn't really explain. It sort of assumes, you know, what those things are already because it's for professionals in the field. So it's good. We have to give a background on what all this is. So I think we pretty much established that postmodernism is a, a, a radical skepticism of there being an objective reality that we can learn anything about. Um, that is separate from our perceptions. So that would that be a good way of describing it? I think so. I think that's okay. I think that's true. Which, to be clear, constructivists don't hold that same view as postmodernists do. Constructivists right. do think there is an objective reality. So we can get into that. Yeah, and you can be so. All right, he says. Um, Which page? So are you he's taught. Uh, I'm on page seventy-two at the top. So this um, this author. Alex Went is talking about critical theorists. So um, he is explaining um, that critical theory is not really a single theory. Um, and that the critics of critical theory, which is kind of a funny way of saying it, not hit my <laughs> words, not his, um, are maybe misunderstanding um, critical theorists. So he says some critical theorists are statists. I'm guessing that means like state as in the state, um, like, you know, like a nation, uh, and some are not, some believe in science and some do not. Some are optimists, some are pessimists, some stress process and some structure. Thus in my reply, I speak only for myself as a constructivist, hoping that other critical theorists may agree with much of what I say. And so in this paper, he says he addresses four issues, the assumptions, uh, objective knowledge, explaining war and peace, and then policymakers' responsibility. So we're going to focus on the first two things because yeah. the other stuff is kind of like the topical part of the paper that is outside anything I could comment on. Yeah. So and he, goes, and he goes on to and correct me if I'm wrong, but he goes on to make it clear too that there are postmodern critical theorists and they're constructive ones. Yeah, there's mo there's modernist constructivists and postmodernist constructivists. So. Um, it goes on, if you want to jump ahead, to the critical paragraph. It's on page 75. Um, it's the second paragraph. And I'm just going to read it because I think it really cap it like captures the, the situation. So the epistemological... Oh, it, oh you zoomed. <laughs> Sorry. So the epistemological issue is whether we can have objective knowledge of the structures in the world. So these structures... Here, Mearsheimer ignores a key distinction between modern and postmodern critical theorists. The latter are indeed skeptical about the possibility of objective knowledge, although in their empirical work, they attend to evidence and inference. Constructivists, however, are modernists who fully endorse the scientific project of falsifying theories against evidence. In an article cited by Mearsheimer, I advocate a scientific realist approach to social inquiry which takes a very pro-science line. And despite his claims, there is now a substantial body of constructivist empirical work that embodies a wholly conventional epistemology. So he's basically saying that you can do constructivism with rationality, but there are a bunch of people who don't. And I'm thinking those are the people that Mearsheimer is criticizing. Mm -hmm. And my own thought is that the naive postmodern um, form of constructivism is is largely the domain of students who uh have not studied philosophy and don't really realize that relativism uh has not been taken seriously by most philosophers for a very long time mm -hmm. um so and he even mentions that in here um and yep. then the second the paragraph after that is actually also super good so Mearsheimer's right, however, that critical theorists do not think we can make a clean distinction between subject and object. This critical theory we just talked about has a lot of postmodern elements to it. Then again, almost all philosophers of science today reject such a naive epistemology. There you go. All observation is theory laden in the sense that what we see is mediated by our existing theories. And to that extent, knowledge is inherently problematic. But this does not mean that observation, let alone reality, is theory determined. It doesn't mean that it's determined by like what we think of it. It's it's already there. The world it's not is still by yeah. cultural constructs. Right. So he says the world is still out there constraining our beliefs and may punish us for incorrect ones, 
Montezuma mm. had a theory that the Spanish were gods, but it was wrong with disastrous consequences. <laughs> I think that I love that example. It's so concise because um, that was that was a cultural belief. The Spanish mm. were definitely not gods, though. They were very far from it. Um, we do not have unmediated access to the world as in it's filtered always through our biases, but this does not preclude understanding how it works. So mm -hmm. we can say that the white male physics perspective is one face of reality and it's maybe incomplete and we need other perspectives. That's a completely exactly. thing you can say within rationality, but to say that the white male physics thing is biased and therefore wrong and we have to throw it all out, that's actually the anti-science part of it because that's saying that we can't actually learn anything and that all the knowledge we have is like made up by white men or something. I, I really have a hard time actually formulating like what they mean because it sounds so crazy to me, but I think that that's close anyway. Yeah. The idea, I, I think another way to say it is that a critical theorist, postmodern critical theorist would basically state that knowledge is constructed by somebody else what what we think is true constructed by somebody else well somebody else would construct it differently and therefore there's no truth that's not what a classical liberal and enlightenment approach would be in which we recognize again this is another good book to go read is jonathan rausch's constitution of knowledge because he mm -hmm. summarizes Karl popper and all the works quite nicely and i think in a very excellent fashion um but he basically talks about it in a lot of depth and I'm probably repeating myself ad nauseum for folks who are longtime listeners of this channel because I've said this so many times, in that we recognize that perspective over here, perspective over here, you may have some biases going on. We recognize that. But the purpose of a classical liberal, actually, do I have it? That might be even better in terms of a way to describe it. There was a published article recently from um, Anna Kralov, is at, <laughs> is at it again in publishing stuff. Oh, yeah. Um, that I thought would be useful. So I have it over here. Um, they actually just published something on um, how critical social justice subverts scientific publishing, which is something else I'm going to read at some point. Oh, um, yeah. Do, 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 do. Um, but, 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 where is it? Yeah, the telos or purpose of a scientific publisher is to facilitate the communication of valid scientific research. This is accomplished through rigorous peer, rigorous peer review by editorial work aiming to identify and rectify possible flaws in submitted papers. This process serves as an epi epistemic funnel. It accepts numerous ideas and propositions, but only those that within, withstand the scrutiny of the reality-based community of experts emerge out the other end. These experts assess the strengths and weaknesses of the approach, the quality of the data, the rigor of the analysis, the soundness of the conclusions, and the relationship of the findings to the existing body of knowledge. Recently, however, scientific publishers introduced so-called diversity, equity, inclusion considerations into the editorial process. Um, do, 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 do. Scientific publishers are key agents in what Jonathan Rausch calls the constitution of knowledge, the network of rules, practices, and institutions that facilitates the production of knowledge. Thus, the subversion of the mission by scientific publishing by critical social justice ideology threatens the entire scientific enterprise. That's from the introduction. But the, the key part is the first part that I read, because all of those experts that are critiquing from the reality-based community come at it from extremely different perspectives and see things quite differently in how things work and what have you. And the idea being, yes, all of you are dedicated to figuring out what the truth is about something. And based upon that, well, <laughs> well, you um, you can then ferret, ferret out what thing is good and what thing is bullcrap and go towards the things that give us a more complete understanding of our reality via falsification and the like. Um, a critical post, a postmodern critical theorist doesn't think you can do that because they're all, you know, all particularly biased. The whole thing is biased by the dominant power structure and what have you. Does that yeah. kind of summarize it yeah i think so i mean i think this is uh like a lot of what the um sort of like neoconservative i don't even know what you call i guess it's the the libertarian movement i'm just gonna call it that because it's it's like the 
like we're having a little mini renaissance of um enlightenment ideas where everyone's like oh wait yeah no we have to care about rationality that's right because if you don't you go insane okay yeah so that movement whatever you want to call those people i don't even know what you name them but yeah i mean this is like 101 stuff like this is i think the core disagreement and i i worry a lot though that like i mean i'm not a big fan of the idea of like overnight sweeping change because i really i'm in the school of popper and the open society where he talks about like the piecemeal change versus revolutions and there are things that i would like to see revolutionized but i know that that's that when you do those things that tends to cause more problems uh, along with the solutions and that slow methodical painstaking piecemeal change is the way to do it but i would like to see some change in our education system where we actually teach um where universities have a required philosophy of science or some kind of epistemology related course that every student is required to take that is like on par with like composition one and two like something that's that fundamental because what seems to happen is you've got these you know otherwise intelligent people i think they're capable of doing some pretty difficult things like the scientists and the the uh, humanities faculty and things like that where they get into these workshops and they hear things like you know reality is socially constructed and then blah 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 what does that mean and then they get the definition that oh well time culture um race perspective gender da, da, all these different identities have an influence on the questions that you ask and the things that you know and that sounds totally reasonable, which it, it is reasonable, actually. Well, I mean, there's, um, and there's then a it's like a Trojan horse for all these other like very bad ideas mm -hmm. that kind of like get delivered, like you know, kind of. And then, by the way, also reality is not a thing. And then mm -hmm. all of a sudden, you've got these people that are just like, I mean, especially the students because they they don't actually have the tools to like suss out, you know, how much. How much of what I'm being told is actually um, logical and mm. healthy, and does it actually have explanatory power? You, you know, you don't actually know because you've not been taught how to think. <laughs> so that's what I think yeah. the scariest thing about this is. And so you hear things that are like you hear things that you think. Um, I don't know. I guess it was James Lindsay. I, I I'm not always a fan of his approach, so I don't always like no, to quote he, him. He, but he can come off. Uh, he can come off pretty, yeah. <laughs> pretty crazy but at it, times, but yeah, he's, but it, he's very, he very did. Normal. He did point out about the workshops how I guess he said in one of his podcasts that like, well, they can't possibly mean that, do they? And I'm like, they do mean that, and and I think many of these these DEI people are counting on the fact that the academics are going to not realize that they actually mean that, and they mean they think they mean something more reasonable, like knowledge is culturally um, filtered, which is not crazy at all. And so there's a, like, you know, there's a way you can do that scientifically. And I, there's a point at the bottom of page 74 on this paper that I, I think kind of goes along with this. So he is, uh, so it's like right above so if you go to page 74, it's right above the bottom title where it says objectivity. Yeah, I think I'm in there. Yeah. So, yep, it's the, yep, you, you highlighted it too. Okay, so if critical theories fail, this will be because they do not explain how the world works, not because of their values. Emphasizing the latter recalls the old realist tactic of portraying opponents as utopians more concerned with how the world ought to be than how it is. So I would say actually that there are, are a lot of people who are uh, openly avowed utopians <laughs> and are very focused on how the world ought to be and are not really interested in describing how it is because they are afraid that that will reinforce the power structures that they don't like. So if Mearsheimer is, uh, is criticizing that, I don't actually think that it's necessarily a tactic. It's actually a viewpoint because maybe some of the constructivists that he's interacted with are postmodernists and are utopian, but 
Went makes the point that not all of them are. And I would believe that. I think that that's true. Um, and it's funny because it's also kind of a tactic to call something a tactic. Um, <laughs> and, and in a way, maybe neither of those things are tactics and it's just evidence of people starting from different priors. And that's really like you told me earlier before we went on that um, the two worlds are not, they're not in the same paradigm. So they keep talking past each other. And that is really the problem. I don't think anybody is using a tactic so much as they're just describing how they interpret the other side through their own lens. And that's just, the, I think, a big problem with these two schools. Yeah, definitely. I think so, too. Um... Yeah. But, yeah, I think maybe um, the activists and the students in particular are the ones kind of pushing the utopianism and then kind of, I guess, drowning out the voices of the modernist rational constructivists who are actually doing something empirically like valuable. <laughs> so I would, I would definitely believe that that is a problem in the humanities and it's worth kind of letting the, the listeners know that that's a thing, because if you hear about constructivism, you don't need to automatically assume that it's DEI. It's sometimes actually is a rational method that you can use mm -hmm. in history and politics and stuff. So it's more yeah. the postmodern critical theorists that you have to be wary of. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I approach things. I mean, it, it would honestly not surprise me if the postmodernism that's at the root of so many of the um, what the college kids are believing these days about society and the world and all, you know, all of the things that we talk about, if that's really at the root of the anxiety epidemic, because I had much worse anxiety when I believed postmodernist type things. Like, um, you know, there was a time in my life where I was entertaining the possibility that people really could walk through walls. So I've definitely been through it. Yeah, I reveal little bits of past crazy Gina in all of these episodes, but I don't know if I actually really fully embraced that, but I was contemplating it because I had health problems and so what that goes through, what that connects to is if you believe that reality is your perception, then you can perceive yourself well. You can perceive yourself as walking through the wall. You can perceive anything. And if you do it like hard enough or whatever, that it will happen. And that, that can make you nuts because then you're just thinking like, oh no, I just had a bad thought. Is that going to give me cancer? Oh no, I just had this other thought. Is that going to make that happen? Now I'm worried about this. Is that going to make it happen? Or like, oh, I'm yeah. having symptoms again. Does that mean that I did something wrong in my head? And it really does make you like, like loony. I, I have to say, like, I, I think that, um, I struggled with a lot of psychological stuff for many years after coming out of that. And I, whenever I see, sort of the like the hint of the postmodernist stuff kind of creeping through all of these otherwise well-meaning useful ideas it's just like no 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 that's how you ruin it stop yeah <laughs> and the no. oh there was in the in the atheist sphere there's like this kind of saying that um has to do with alternative medicine and it's like you can't integrate alternative medicine into science-based medicine because it's like incorporating apple pie into cow pie. It doesn't make the cow pie better. It makes the apple pie worse. So I think the cow pie is postmodernism and you can't legitimate postmodernism by mixing constructivism into it. It just makes the constructivism crappier. So, yeah. And, and one of the things with like postmodernist thought is the, the notion that the thing is going around in society is what basically constructs both your experiences and your thoughts about it. If you're talking about the individual. So like Randall Kennedy writes writing for heterodox Academy actually talked about this in depth in terms of the problem with that. That's where the notion of lived experience comes from. It's just like, well, I construct my knowledge from reality and what have you. And that's why I know that this dominant worldview is off from line and all this other kind of stuff. But the problem with the lived experience notion is we don't all have the same experiences to begin with, even two people of the same demographic groups, you know, otherwise have the same like sexual orientation, religion, all the way down, don't have the same experiences. But yeah. moreover, it ignores the fact that folks have very different intellects. So folks can have the same experience, but 
give different meaning to that experience, having nothing yeah. to do necessarily with the social society, what have you going on. Yeah. But they think about it differently. We do forget about things like personality and temperament and what have you, in addition to the yeah. cultural side of things. Um, the best yeah. example, Randall Kennedy gives us as a great example, is the difference between Justice Clarence Thomas and the late Justice Thurgood Marshall. They grew up in similar, if not very identical experiences almost being being black men who grew up in the Jim Jim Crow South you can you can imagine some of the things that they experienced in very very similar and yet they have two very different things they've made of it in terms of how they think about the problem both of them ended up being supreme court justices <laughs> but right. they had very different opinions um and understanding of why those things came about how to correct them all those other kinds of things that came about um just on personality and temperament and what they read and what they thought about the world and believed and what have you. And they grew up in the same kind of cultural things that were going on around them where they could have ended up believing the same things, but they didn't. Um, and that's the apple application of intellect to make meaning of an experience. Um, and intellect is intellect and personality and temperament are very different things amongst individuals. Um, yeah. And it goes, it goes also, I think of also the microaggressions literature. Um, so like one of the big things in the DEI world is the microaggressions, right? But when you dive into the microaggressions literature, what do you find is a lot of folks where it's canonically considered a microaggression to say certain things, it's like 50-50 on whether or not somebody's actually offended. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And it, if, if it's true that people of like sort of a sensitive temperament are attracted to progressivism because they are compassionate people that want to help others and they want to make the world a better place and they care about human rights and they care about equity and equality and all those things that is going to attract a sensitive person who for good reason is sensitive and that's that's like a positive trait but then it can also be a susceptibility to like you know over interpreting aggression where it isn't there and that's you know that is kind of a the a malady of the times i think mm -hmm. so yeah so i guess i don't know uh, did you have any other things from the paper that you wanted to bring up because i think i hit all of my notes at least that's relevant to what we were talking about yeah i was just thinking the um if there's something on the assumption is there anything else on the assumptions that you wanted to hit or yeah let's see this is one of those times where i wish we had call-in questions because i feel like um <laughs> you know I may have something that I want to say, but then there might be something that the listeners want me to say or you to say, and we won't know until afterwards. So, wow. um, to do one of these live at some point. <laughs> yeah, that would be fun. Um, yeah. So, oh, I guess he says, um, there was another part that I underlined. Is this in the assumptions section or is this in epistemology? I can't remember. Let me, yeah, it's still in the assumptions part. So, um, he says, in, in summation, and we may have already hit on this, social structures are real and objective. They're not just talk. But this objectivity depends upon shared knowledge. And in that sense, social life is ideas all the way down. That is until you get to biology and natural resources. Thus to ask, when do ideas as opposed to power and interest matter? Um, it's is asking the wrong question. Ideas always matter since power and interest do not have effects apart from the shared knowledge that constitutes them as such. And I think he's pointing out what I was saying earlier about how power is like a, a really imprecise term and probably exists on some kind of gradient, if, if anything. Um, and then uh, also that when you try, I know this was something that happened where a friend of mine and, uh, and I got in an argument about um, some kind of gender related thing. And I was talking to her about like philosophical, I was using kind of like the philosophy way of talking where you do like an extreme edge case to demonstrate the flaws in a, in a, in a, it's like a thought experiment. So it's like by, de by design, not realistic. And so I was saying something like that and she goes, but that's just an abstract idea and that's not relevant to like real people. And I'm like, well, ideas matter. And then when you um, like the abstract ideas do actually relate to the real people. So that's why you do those kinds of exercises. And so I was glad to see him 
say that because I think sometimes when you get into conversations with people in the activist mindset, they're willing to talk about the abstract ideas if the abstract ideas are on their side, but then they won't talk about the abstract ideas if they happen to be liberty related or something that, that they don't like. So um, just kind of pointing out that duplicitousness, that, that ideas yeah. always matter and that power is a very subjective term. Oh yeah. And that in fact, you can, uh, you can almost point this out. It might even be a point of agreement between you know, a libertarian and a, and a DEI person that of course knowledge is shared and that these ideas are defined by what we agree that they are because they're all constructs, but they are also real in, in a sense that like we can observe social structures from a third party perspective. We can say, oh, Britain and the US are friends sit from sitting in India or, you know, you know, that kind of thing. You can, you can see relationships. They are things that you can um, observe in, from multiple perspectives. So uh, does that, I mean, I'm like rambling, yeah. but I guess that's like just a side point about how, you know, in these conversations, you have to find common ground. And I think I, what I liked about this paper is like knowing that the author and the person he's criticizing, they have like a friendly adversarial way yeah. of, talking about these ideas where they know that the other comes from a different school of thought and they're trying to harmonize them in some way and figure out what they agree on, exactly. which I think comes down to rationality, which again, this is why postmodernism is so unhealthy because if you, if you take away the rationality and the falsification mm -hmm. and all the Popperian stuff, then it all falls apart. You can't have a conversation about anything. And sometimes mm -hmm. I wonder if that is the goal is to make everything fall apart, which I'm not in favor of. <laughs> No, I'm not in favor of that either. And that postmodernism does have a thing for deconstruction <laughs> compared to the constructivist kind of view um, of everything. Yeah, and I think they're like, they're deconstructivists. <laughs> there's, a, there's a, yeah, there's a certain interesting thing to it because I think a lot of, um, a lot of the things with postmodernists in particular is like every bit of knowledge is constructed by dominant power, right? Um, and it seems to come with an assumption that, well, we can reorder society to, um, you know, experts can reorder society in ways to help ameliorate these things of systemic discrimination and what have you. That's sort of the general thing of where it ends up going um, that, that you've seen, yeah. like the EI folks and the critical social justice related um, things yeah. and what have you. And it speaks to the difference in like conflicting visions of knowledge. So I don't know exactly where constructivists yeah. themselves line up on this particular aspect, but um, I think of, I have Thomas Sowell's book open here because it made me think of the section in the chapter on knowledge fallacies related to social justice related movements. Um, so yeah, I pull a little bit from that because what, um, what Thomas Sowell talks about is the notion of consequential knowledge um and who thinks what knowledge is consequential and who has that consequential knowledge in a particular mm -hmm. decision um so like for example for many social issues the most important decision is who makes the decision both social justice advocates and the critics critics might agree that many consequential social decisions are best made by those who have the most relevant knowledge but they have radically different assumptions as to who in fact has the most knowledge. That is partly because they have radically different conceptions on what is defined as knowledge. Such differences of opinion as to what constitutes knowledge go back for centuries. Intellectuals view of knowledge was satirized in a verse by 19th century British scholar, Benjamin Jowett, master of Balliol College at Oxford University. Quote, my name is Benjamin Jowett. If it's knowledge, I know it. I am master of this college. What I don't know isn't knowledge. Mm. <laughs> With his humor. Yeah. Many people do not regard all information as deserving of being called, uh, deserving to be called knowledge or would not regard the possessors of some kinds of information as being knowledgeable as possessors of some other kinds of information. A carpenter may know how to build a fence and a physicist may know that E equals MC squared. But even if neither of them knows what the other knows, many people would consider the physicist more knowledgeable, whether because his knowledge required more study or an intellect capable of mastering more complex information. Knowledge, however, does not exist in a simple hierarchy. 
with the special kind with the kind of special knowledge taught in schools and colleges at the top and more mundane knowledge at the bottom some knowledge in either category is more consequential than other knowledge that varies with specific circumstances and the kinds of decisions to be made rather than varying with the complexity or elegance of the knowledge itself so that is thomas soul um, and what he goes on to talk about in the following section is many examples in history, be it um, from the Titanic or from immigration related things or what have you, where like in the immigration example, people immigrated to a particular place in the countries they immigrated to. Why? Because there were a bunch of folks already in that particular area who had knowledge of how to get a job, how to do this, how to do that, um, and what have you. Um, and so there's those kinds of features in here, but what he also goes on to note um, in here is that the opposite vision of having that kind of local knowledge from individuals and what have you is the notion that um, consequential knowledge, here we go, an opposite vision of knowledge and its distribution has likewise had a very long pedigree behind its opposite conclusions, namely that consequential knowledge is concentrated in intellectually more advanced people. The question of what constitutes knowledge was among the things addressed in the two-volume 1793 treatise entitled Inquiry Concerning Political Justice by William Godwin. Um, to Godwin, explicitly articulated reason was the source of knowledge and understanding. In this way, just views of society, quote, in the minds of, quote, the liberally educated and reflecting members of society will enable them to be quote, to the people, guides, and instructors. Here, the assumption of superior knowledge and understanding did not lead to casting an intellectual elite in the role of surrogate decision makers as part of the government, but as influencers of the public, who in turn were expected to influence the government. So that's a lot mm -hmm. of basis in here in which he talks about um, not just um, not just Godwin, but uh, John Stuart Mill, Karl Marx, Rousseau. Yeah, Rousseau, despite his emphasis on society being guided by the general will, left that interpretation of that will to elites. He likened the masses of the people to a, quote, stupid, wholesome, mm. wholesy, wholesy, I don't know, pusil animus, there we go, invalid. <laughs> Others in the oh, 18th no. century left, such as William Godwin and Marquis, Marquis de Concordat, um, expressed similar contempt for the masses. In the 19th century, Karl Marx said, quote, the working class is revolutionary or it is nothing. Uh, in other words, millions of fellow human beings mattered only if they carried out the Marxian vision. Hmm. Maybe in socialist pioneer George Bernard Shaw regarded the working class as being among the detestable people who have no right to live. He yeah. added, I should despair yeah. if I did not know that they will all die presently and that there is no need on earth why they should be replaced by people like themselves. Oh my goodness. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of that kind of thing in the history books that feeds into some of the social justice thinking that society should be ordered by the elite. <laughs> and it's so weird because they actually would also hate that too at the same mm -hmm. time. Because if it's not them, yeah, it's yeah. This is the this is why I think it's oh, unfortunate. Here's, here's a little bit more. Yeah, hold on. Okay, sorry. <laughs> no, you're fine. Time, sure. In our times, prominent legal scholar Professor Ronald Dworkin of Oxford University declared that quote, a more equal society is a better society, even if its citizens prefer inequality. French feminist pioneer Simone de Beauvoir likewise said, no woman should be authorized to stay at home and raise her children. Society should be totally different. Women should not have that choice precisely because if there is such a choice, too many women will make that one. Oh, uh, what? <laughs> in a similar I, vein. Heaven in, forbid people do what they want. <laughs> oh my goodness. Vein, super activist Ralph Nader said that the consumer must be protected at times from his own indiscretion and vanity. We have already seen how similar attitudes led genetic determinists in the early 20th century to casually advocate imprisoning people who had committed no crime and denying them a normal life on the basis of unsubstantiated beliefs that were then in vogue in intellectual circles. 
Given the conception of knowledge prevalent among many elite intellectuals and the distribution of such knowledge implied by that conception, it is hardly mm -hmm. surprising that they reach the kinds of conclusions that they do. Indeed, to make the opposite assumption that one's own great achievements and competence are confined to a narrow band out of the vast spectrum of human concerns could be a major impediment to promoting social crusades that preempt the decisions of others who are supposedly to be the beneficiary of such crusades as the quest for social justice. There you Yikes. go. That would yeah. Be <laughs> yeah, that's laying it down right there. For our listening audience, this is Thomas Sowell's latest book, what I was just reading from, Social Justice Fallacies, which I very much recommend. Yeah, and like you said, he's 93, and this is his 49th book. He's a prolific individual. That is for he sure. It's one more book before he passes away. <laughs> I hope he gets to, yeah, I hope he gets to 50, just because that's a nice <laughs> round number, you know, like, do it. So even if it's like 10 pages long, it'll still be like the 50th book, so... <laughs> But the point of what he's saying is that a lot of the, the foundational literature that gets to social justice, including um, including the postmodernist literature, focuses on the idea that the intellectuals are <laughs> can order everything, really. Yeah. yeah, and it's, I mean, in some of the so much for, I should say, but yeah, I mean, are these really the same people? I guess like you've got the ones that want the classless society, and then the ones that want the society with classes, but as long as the upper class is the correct, morally correct upper class, it's always very hard to tell what, well, I guess it's hard to tell what, what diversity, equity, and inclusion is about, like what, oh, yeah. given, like, I mean, given that they have found a problem with just about every structure in society, what, what would they like to replace it with? And I guess you see some articles about like Native American math and some of these things, but it's just, it's always I, very like, okay, well, how's that going to work then? You know? Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's what I was going to say. A lot of the postmodernist thought in the literature that I've read in particular the recent years has basically focused on, we're going to do this, this, and this, and it's going to help, it's going to help, you know, make folks from this marginalized group be more, mm -hmm. uh, more included um, and what have you. And the point that Thomas Sowell is making is this is being ordered by an intellectual who does not necessarily have consequential knowledge that the person they are trying to help does, I think is the point that's yeah. trying to be made there in that, um, shoot, there, there's a bunch of different examples that, that he has in the book. Yeah. I really appreciate that basically highlights when there's been the thing of let's push it this way it usually ended up being worse for the person that they thought they were helping. But oh, sure. Yeah. Like there's back, like it backfires because, you know, sweeping change tends to create a lot of like side effect type problems. Like the, right. when you try to change too much too quickly, um, mm -hmm. the, it, which it case, sometimes, yeah. Right. In which case, ignoring the consequential knowledge that the person, the people you were trying to, or you are claiming in, hopefully in good faith and well-meaning yeah. to try and help doesn't yeah. actually help folks. And you ignore the consequential knowledge that you needed to actually be helpful. Um, yeah. And that is what well, tends so, to happen. I mean, I guess you could do, I guess Went points this out too, somewhere in the thing where you can actually do critical theory kind of with empiricism. And so that's where you criticize something and then you, um, you can falsify, you, you I think what? It's in that, I think it's in that key paragraph because he mentions, um, yeah. he mentioned that the postmodern critical theorists are indeed skeptical about the, oh yeah, there we are. We'll use empirical work, even, um, even they attend to evidence and inference, which is sometimes very shaky yeah. and do it, but, um, <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, evidence and inference doesn't necessarily mean they're doing falsification. Sometimes yeah. it can be the way the news does it, where they have a bunch of things that are factually verifiable, but the interpretation itself is completely flawed. So mm -hmm. that's like, um, that's a whole, that's a whole nother problem. But, yeah. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, yeah, I guess I forgot what I was going to say about Thomas Sowell, but yeah, anyway, um, sure. 
postmodernism okay, sucks. Really That's the end yeah. of this topic. So. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And he, I think he also speaks from the perspective of, um, you know, the marginalized groups that the left thinks they are helping. And, you know, since he, he speaks from an economic standpoint, he's probably in the Milton Friedman camp more so yeah. than not. Yeah. And, uh, you know, the welfare state is probably, he's not probably a fan of the welfare state where no. it's not the government's job no, to ensure that everyone yeah. has a, a He's he's not that? even a fan of the mandatory minimum wage. Yeah, that's Milton Friedman too. Milton Friedman doesn't believe in minimum wage either. And I think it's an interesting argument that I am not really qualified to comment on, but it seems it's it's it seems actually like it makes sense to not have a minimum wage. I mean, I know that obviously if we removed the minimum wage laws overnight, it would cause more problems than it would solve, but I think it is an interesting predicament that we've gotten ourselves into with trying to help people and maybe it has actually backfired. <laughs> no, here, here's, so. here's a point to make. Um, differences in assumptions about the distribution of consequential knowledge are more incidental social curiosities. People seeking similar goals can reach radically different conclusions about the way to achieve those goals when they have radically different beliefs about the nature and distribution of the consequential knowledge required. In some cases, the goals themselves can seem possible or impossible, depending on what kind of knowledge distribution would be required to reach those goals. Now, I'm thinking about it. I'm trying to get back to some of the, like, the postmodern thought of thinking you know, everything's culturally constructed and all this other kind of stuff. I would mm -hmm. feel like a modernist might go into the thing of, well, because it's all this dominant stuff, you've, you've ignored all this knowledge about society from all these marginalized groups and might go in that direction um, alongside of the notion yeah. of there's not objective reality. And I think one of the things I was trying to say I, 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 that comes to mind, I think, is the also the notion that it's not like they don't point, it's not like that we're not pointing out things that are flawed. Because we can be honest and say, yeah, there are some questions that get ignored when scientists do research, and that often has to do just with who, who is funding it <laughs> um, in terms of mm -hmm. what questions get answered and what have you. And that is a legitimate complaint. I'm not going to, I'm not going to knock that. That is a legitimate complaint. But to say that it's also because of what the dominant power structure and system requires rather than maybe this is a more consequential question to the scientific side um of things like figuring out what the like what is. like what do you actually need to know how to do in order to solve the problem that's exactly. what you're saying yeah yeah exactly um yeah. doesn't mean you're necessarily intentionally ignoring somebody's knowledge and what have you but then again we've also yeah. already talked about the fact that postmoderns don't think there is an objective truth to get at to begin with yeah i mean that's really where it goes off the rails because as soon as you take that as soon as you remove the postmodernism problem and everyone is a modernist and a rationalist and uh, an empiricist and they use falsification methods and that kind of thing as soon as everyone's kind of on that page then you can actually do something even with the diversity ideas we can talk about that because you can you can point out like, yeah, there's, you know, is it, you can ask the question, is this a result of discrimination rather than assuming it is a result of discrimination, for example, that like if there's an imbalance in some group or does it even matter in terms of like the problem that you're trying to solve with whatever this group of people is like, does it actually matter if there's an even distribution of all the races and sexes and everything for this particular situation. Maybe it does for some, maybe it doesn't for other things. So like being able to actually talk about those con about those things becomes impossible when you take out objective reality. Like if we just decide that that, you know, and I don't really have any proof, for example, because we don't have proof of anything really that there that there is an objective reality. We kind of assume there is, but the fruits of be of thinking that way are much greater than the fruits of not oh, thinking yeah. that way like it it just produces you have more in your hands you can do more with that if you just decide there's no real what do you do then just sit on social media and yell at people because that is what a lot of them do <laughs> well 
I mean, Jonathan Rausch also points this out in that before we did the notion of trying to be reality based and focusing mm -hmm. on figuring out what is objectively true, mm -hmm. a lot of times it was just, for lack of a better word, tribal. Um, yes. Folks, you know, yeah. in their different tribes, believe certain things. And if you didn't, you weren't part of the tribe and you did have. Right you did have wars and disagreements over that. There are certain social reasons for wars and conflict and what have you, alongside of materialistic ones in terms, in terms of my limited knowledge of international politics. Anyway. Yeah. <laughs> read the bit, paper, uh, read the other half of the paper that we're not discussing and maybe that'll give you <laughs> some, but, um, oh goodness. I just lost your train of thought. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there it goes. Maybe a little bit. we need sound effects and animations oh, of like the I thought just going back back now. Okay. I know, it's I know back. what's going on. It's back. Um, but Jonathan mentions this in the context of when you had that just bloody disagreement and no sort of set of rules of figuring out what reality is and all this other kind of things, you pretty much had utter stagnation. Not just in not just in, you know, Africa or China or or Australia or any place like that, but in Europe, um, mm -hmm. think of like the dark ages. That's <laughs> a good example of that. Um, yeah. you didn't have any real progress in human thriving and flourishing. Right. When those kinds of ideas were broadly adopted, that is when, that is when different societies took off thriving, mm -hmm. flourishing, developing economies, providing much better living standards for their people because you could get at all these reality-based questions, figure out what's better for like housing, for example, <laughs> um, going from sort of thatched yeah. huts to being in a house with a roof over your head that is sturdy enough to stand up to a hurricane or to a tornado, whereas right. you know other things would be blown away um, and those kinds of things. Yeah, That doesn't happen without some kind of a commitment to figuring out what reality is to having some kind of a sense that there is an objective reality to begin with mm -hmm. um, and, you know, trying to pursue it. Yeah. So if you go back into the thing where there is not an objective reality, well, mm -hmm. you're basically talking about taking away human, human thriving and flourishing. And I think about a bunch of the problems and related things that we have going on now, be it mm -hmm. climate change or pandemic diseases mm -hmm. or any number of things, cancer and what have you. I don't think that's a good idea if you're talking about solving big problems. <laughs> <laughs> no, definitely not. Definitely not. Oh, that was my train of yeah. thought that it that got lost yeah. for a minute and then came back. Yeah, and our our older style of thinking was not just tribal; it was it was like metaphorical. So mm -hmm. uh, we now call it metaphorical, but for people, the the pre enlightenment, the pre, I guess before the Greeks, really, like before those sorts of ideas started emerging, where you know the Greek philosophers were starting to ask, um, you know, can I test this? Can I, can I verify this? Can I, you know, is the idea of evidence, like, so the idea that there was a real world and then there were ideas and perceptions like that is even an innovation. So before that, it was just, you know, you see the sun in the sky, the sun is God, like that kind mm -hmm. of stuff where you're not saying, oh, that's the sun. And I'm calling it God as a metaphor. You were just, that was God. Like th there was not a, like a separation between true and not true or real and not real. It was just, you know, so we had, we had a much more symbolic metaphorical way of thinking. And so I don't know when, when we want to wrap up, cause it's been like almost hour and a half, but I can say <laughs> at least my final thought, um, which I flew out of my head just as I was about to say it. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> I'm getting old. <laughs> so join the club. Come, join me come back. <laughs> so I mean, I can um, have my final thought if you want me to go first. Yeah, you go and then I'll try to think of what it was going to be because it was good, I think. <laughs> I think to, to wrap up in the summary of this is that um, constructivists, for the most part, have the same view about objective reality that liberal enlightenment and conservatives and um, many others 
do in that there is a real and knowable objective reality where constructivists, I think, may differ from the more liberal and conservative groups is that there's something of a blurred boundary there between um, subjective and objective um, makes it much more difficult to know, whereas liberal enlightenment kind of philosophy, well, mm -hmm. that's the reason we have the competing things and the yeah. uh, the competing perspectives in terms of ferreting out what is true and what is not. Um, yeah. Reality, whereas postmodernists don't think objective reality exists at all. Yeah. Either literature. <laughs> yeah, or like, I guess by extension, they probably don't think it's worth trying to sort out the common, the commonalities and the differences mm -hmm of everybody's filters. So, yeah. you know, in a way, science is the one that's actually embracing the fact that we all have biases and that we all see reality differently. That's why we take multiple measurements from different perspectives with different instruments by different people. And it's an international collaboration and, you know, why you repeat experiments and, you know, change variables and try different things. It's because we know that we have biases and filters and we accept that we can still work towards the goal of understanding reality, which, you know, we should do a popper episode, uh, at some point, episode at because some point. I think yeah. that's really like <laughs> every time you were reading something from Thomas Sowell's knowledge, uh, fallacies, I'm like, yeah, but popper said, you know, so I got, I mean, I don't think popper ultimately disagrees with, with, I don't think what Thomas Sowell is saying is like runs counter to any of that, but there may be some tightening up of, of the way things are explained um, as far as like saying things are true and, and that kind of stuff. So, um, but I did remember what I was going to say. So the, um, the fact that we used to not differentiate between real and not real, um, do we really want to go back to that? And Popper even says this in open society, if we want to get rid of the existing power structures, it would require really going back to the beginning, which he says back to the beasts. So it would be going back to uh, metaphorical thinking and we can't because we now have that knowledge and we can't unhave it. And, you know, we were talking in one, maybe we were off, off camera, but, you know, just we can't, we cannot actually get rid of science and, and rockets and miss like you can't get rid of the knowledge that produced those things even if we disarmed every nation and we never went to space and we never had science there we would still have that knowledge and you can't unhave it so it's almost yeah. like yeah there are imperfections but the alternative isn't really possible we can't go back so we have to learn to live in the world that we're in and i think that would benefit everyone to to just accept the world that we have and meet it where it is and solve the problems we can solve. So awesome. Yeah. <laughs> Signing off. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, let, let us all, right. all know what you think in the comments. We'd appreciate it. Um, but yeah, I don't have anything else to add. Um, all righty. Yeah. I can if I had a microphone, I would do that. Right. <laughs> yeah. I got one in front of me, but I don't want to drop it. Um, right. <laughs> all right, everybody. Thank you for watching. Thank you for listening. Uh, of course, let us know if you like, if you, uh, like what you, uh, heard and also let us know your thoughts on postmodernism and constructivism and liberal enlightenment and all that, all that jazz. But until next time, we all hope you stay very curious. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Rogue Journal Club. If you want to suggest articles for the show, please consider becoming a supporter of shiasofia.locals.com. The link for the Locals community is available in the show notes. The Rogue Journal Club is a Shia Sophia production. Copyright 2022.